welcome um, to this session, Look Sharp. On my left, I have Derry, uh, Dr. Larry Lokshin, who I'm sure uh, many of you will know. Just, just quickly though, um, he's the Professor of Wine Marketing um, and Head of the School of Marketing at the University of South Australia. But what also is fantastic, he is a viticulturist by training and you will tell by his accent, he's not from here. Um, but welcome, Larry. Next to him is Matt Gant, who is one of our judges and has been a judge at the show on and off. We love having him here. He's a great guy. He's also a co-owner of First Drop in um, the Barossa, but sources fruit obviously elsewhere because he's a mad Italiophile. Uh, he loves the Duro, he loves Spain, gosh he loves a lot of things to do with wine. Um, a really good guy, terrific winemaker, and he's not from here. <laughs> next, to, next to him is uh, uh, Mel Lesh, uh, welcome, who is uh, an artist but also a graphic designer and uh, has designed some fantastic labels and we're going to hear about that in terms of what's good design, the label she's designed for. Uh, so thank you, Mel, for joining us. And last but not least is Pablo Theodorus, who recently was at um, East End Cellars, so you probably bought a lot of booze from this guy. And now I can say he's a, a publican, which is brilliant, in Adelaide Hills. Uh, I haven't been there yet, but I intend to get to the Stanley Bridge Hotel. Um, I will pay for my drinks, uh, Pablo, so don't worry. So what we're doing today is I'm going to ask Larry to um, do an introduction to this because we're going to look at labels more so, but perhaps a bit about pack packaging. Um, and then we're going to jump to Mel to, to perhaps talk about good design and then we're all going to jump in to look at labels, discuss your labels. Pablo, you know, what, um, what sells? Do labels sell? Because I know for one thing, I have bought wine because I liked the label, or I hated the label and I bought it. Who's done that before? Be honest. Yes, come on, on those who haven't, don't. Well, all right. Anyway, Larry, I'd love you to kick start. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, and um, I'm glad you're drinking wine while I'm talking because I am going to talk quickly because I have too many things to say and not enough time to say it. So. Um, one of the things we do at the Ehrenberg Bass Institute is we look at marketing as a science. It's really a science of human behavior linked to buying, because that's what we do in marketing. And rather than look at a theory and say, well, do people fit the theory, we actually look at what people do, observations across a wide range of conditions. Then we develop what we might call laws or predictions, and then we test them. And that's you can't read it because the screen's too low, but that creates the story. So that's what I'm going to do very quickly. I'm going to talk quickly. Um, so most of the things we think about marketing are actually things we make up. They're anecdotal, they're seat of the pants, and sometimes they work because we're pretty good at thinking about human behavior, and we're all humans, and we think about things, how we would do something, and if we're similar to our consumers, it might work. But if you're not similar to your buyers, you can't really often think about what you would do and have that translate to the marketplace. So I want to talk about two very quick, what we call empirical laws. These are laws, and I call them that because they've been looked at over 50 years now. Many categories, including wine, I'll show you some wine data, but they've been looked at from soft drinks to aviation fuel, <laughs> credit cards, cars. So these are things that have been looked at and tested. So the first thing is, of course we know, and we're here at the Alternative Variety Show, that brands, and if you want to call a great variety a brand, we've done the research, you can really interchange them. So bigger brands, if you want to call them wine brands or soft drink brands, why do they differ from small brands? They actually differ because of the number of buyers. It's not that, I know we talk about niche brands, we talk about repeat buying, yes, I only buy this, it actually, in, in terms across a population of shoppers, just doesn't work. Big brands are bought by more people, that's penetration, but the number of people who rebuy your brand is only slightly higher for a big brand than a small brand. So if you're a small brand and you want to grow, the only way to do it is to get more customers, not to sell lots and lots and lots to the same customers. Yes, your mailing lists and all that are important. You need to keep up with that, but if you don't add new customers, you're not gonna be able to sell more wine. So this is just a very simple chart 
It shows you brands along the left side. It shows you their penetration. The penetration is how many unique buyers there were in a year. And you can see across the top, this was done in a national, was actually I can say it now, it's been done quite a while ago in vintage sellers, a hundred and some stores, 5,000 vintage sellers, car holders across a year. And you can see the brands with the highest penetration are what we call the 75th and 95th brands. These are small brands found in vintage sellers. So any one of those brands is not bought very often, but as a group, those first two groups constitute um, about 40% of the market share of vintage sellers. And that's where your small brands and your small grape varieties would go in. But if you look at the frequency of purchase going down below that, it doesn't change much as the brands go from 80% penetration down to 9%. <coughs> One other thing about loyal customers, if you look at this across, this was across 15 different product categories, that the top 20% of your customers are the heavy group. They buy 50, 60% of your wines. That's quite important and good to keep up with them. But when we measure people year on year, the next year, half of that 50% aren't going to be there as heavy buyers. They might be buying your brand, but they're not there as heavy buyers. So it just says heavy buyers are important, but you've got to keep getting that single sale, that first sale to someone who maybe has never tried your wine or tried your brand or tried that grape variety before. So trying for that different, some of the speakers have talked about being exotic, trying to be different, trying to get people's sense of mystery and all that. I think that's really some of the things we have to do. So. This is a graph of Coke buyers. You can see of people who bought Coke, 30% of the people who bought cola, only 30% didn't buy any Coke. 70% of the market bought Coke, 30% didn't even buy Coke, even though they bought cola. And the shape of that curve looking way out at the end, the people who bought Coke more than once a week is a very, very small number. And that's the shape of the curve. Well, that must be true of Coke. And so if, you're, if you buy Coke more than seven times in a year, you're actually in the heavy buyers of that long tail. It says even Coca-Cola relies on lots and lots of light buyers. So we shouldn't focus only on heavy buyers. That's the, this graph. So, but wine's different, right? Of course wine is different. Well, here's the same picture of a vintage seller's consumers of over 5,000 consumers over a year's period. The reason you have those peaks is because you have a peak at 12 bo one bottle, that's the biggest, tallest line, and you have a peak at 12 bottles and 24 because they give you a discount when you buy lots of wine. But the shape is the same. There are a few people who buy lots of wine, but most of these people in our data set bought one bottle of wine. That's, the, that's what the real world looks like. So a couple other things about marketing. We did a study for it. At what, that time, it was, um, wasn't was Pernod Ricard, it was Jacobs Creek and um, Orlando Wyndham. And we looked at about, um, I can't remember, 30, 40 different wine stores, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide. This shows how long people spend in a wine store. You can't read the bottom, but 4% spend less than one minute. 46% spend between one and three minutes. Now, this is getting in the store and to the checkout, not waiting in line at the checkout. And then 32% spend three to six minutes. So you have basically about 80% of your shoppers are spending less than six minutes in the store before they wait in a checkout. They're not spending a lot of time reading your back label. Labels are important because they're going to make that choice quickly. That's what this is. People are going to look. They're going to say they like it, they dislike it. They, and mostly they say they recall it. It looks familiar. They're going to pull it. Maybe the grape variety has an impact. Certainly most of us are down there at the 20, 30 minutes. I remember the first time I came to Adelaide for a visit in 1994. I lived there since 95. I said, oh, we gotta go out and get a bottle of wine. It's the first time in Australia. I had the wife and kids in the car pulled up to the local wine shop. I'll just run in and get a bottle. When my wife came in about half an hour later, she's very patient, half an hour she waited <laughs> to drag me out of the store. I hadn't even chosen a wine yet. I was still looking at bottles. So some of us are down at that end, but your average consumer really isn't. So your packaging, and I'll say a few words about packaging and then we'll move, up, we'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. It really depends where you're selling it. If it's going to be on the shelf somewhere, it's got to stand out. But our research shows if it stands out too much, if it's too unlike other wines, 
a smaller number of people will choose. It doesn't mean no one will choose it. When we do label testing as part of the services of our institute, we do a bit of that for all kinds of companies. The labels that are the most liked are also the most disliked. And the labels that are kind of okay are typically okay by everybody and not many people like or dislike them. So you choose the kind of label you want. If you're gonna sell in a store, that's a choice you make. You wanna be really different, but also um, maybe people aren't gonna buy you. If you're on a wine list, people don't even see your label. Then your name is important. And that's where the grape variety, I think, becomes either a positive or a negative. If somebody's looking for alternate varieties, well, they might pick your wine, but if they've never heard of some of these wines, like I haven't heard of, I've heard of a lot of the mainstream Italian ones, but a lot of the other ones I certainly haven't heard of, I doubt if I'd ever buy them off a wine list. And of course, direct to the consumer, you can do what you want because you're there to make that hand sale. I will say we're gonna taste some wines blind. Um, I know what they are, I don't know what order they are, I can't remember, but Jane sent me the list. I did a little research on my own, I looked up just the websites of, there's a few ones that are quite large wineries. Most of them are very small um, boutique wineries. I looked up the websites of those wines and 10 of those wineries, the label for the variety that we're tasting is totally different than the rest of their range. So if you knew X winery and you knew what their label looked like and then you went to a shop and you saw this other thing, you would never identify it as from that winery. To me as a marketer, that's a mistake. If you want to build a brand, there has to be a similarity. It doesn't have to be exact, but it has to be something identifiable. The name of the wine, winery, the design doesn't have to be the color, though color is the thing we use the most. That's certainly the most effective and affective, emotional <laughs> part of um, choice is the color. So that was quite interesting to me that I think these wineries are being so alt that they actually don't have the same label for each of their wines, and to me that's a negative. We did a little bit of research, I won't go into the details, but you can see these are real bottles, including Austra Australian and um, American in imported wines. This was in the US, about, I can't remember, 2,000 wine consumers. I'll just go right to the results. But if you look at what people were using to choose, we couldn't, we, ha we can only look at the bottle itself. So the brand package origin accounted for about 36% of the choice and the price 16, so 50 some percent of the choice is based on what that bottle looks like, the brand name, the things that you can add to it, metals, slight descriptions, rating points, even a recommendation, come up with another about 40%, 45%, so those are also important. And the rest of the stuff, alcohol level and all that, really doesn't matter at all. We did a similar thing in Australia, but this was just with Shiraz, it was a specific project, so we were just looking at Shiraz, but we had 21 wines, lots of different, these are just five different labels, different, um, regions, different um, producers, of course. And as you can see, we had, some of the wines had taste descriptions, some had wine ratings. You can see the descriptions and ratings. And what we found is just the fact of putting a description on the shelf below the bottle, when I say increase the choice probability by 7%, you're looking at five bottles. So the random choice would be 20%. So increasing it by 7%, is 27%, the other ones go down. So that actually, just that little bit of what does that taste like is really important to a lot of consumers and can actually help someone buy your wine, but it's gotta be short. You can see, I think we had about a limit of eight words when we were doing this. Of course, putting scores up help, and you can see the highest um, score choice increased by 10% when the scores were high and they were close together. But if you have one high score and even low scores, one high score is enough to tip the scales in your favor. This is some, this, I think everybody knows this, but these are consumers' eyes, objective reasons to choose wine that go beyond what the, the bottle or the brand or the region that they already know. Um, we did some research, and this is the summary of all that. So star ratings, like a simplified point system, I didn't show you that, but the star ratings had the highest in, increase in choice, brand name was second, Price tied with brand name, it's negative, of course, because people buy wines that are cheaper than more expensive. But if you look down, it's near the bottom, label style and label color were much less important with brands that were in the market, because it's the brand that people are buying and the grape variety and the price 
So I'm not saying label's not important, please don't get that wrong, but it's an addition to the long-term building of your brand and choosing of the proper price point. Wow. Okay, so that my recommendations, packaging should inform the buyer with key information. And if you're gonna choose a package, and a, a label design, then choose it for the long term. If, you, if it's a font and the way your brand name is spelled, kept with that, and you can keep with that, and you can change other parts of it, but keep with it over time. And if you're going to update it, if you change your packaging radically, people won't find your brand until you train them from ground zero again. So this is just an example of Lindemann's over 20 years. Is that the end? Is my time up? Yeah. Okay, I'm closing up. 20 years, you can see the wine has gone its way. Um, the packaging should, stoop, should the brand, suit the brand style and marketing. And it's a funny slide of imitations. Here we have Ben Folds. <laughs> Eden Manor Bind 389. That was taken a picture taken on a bottling line in the Barossa. Wow. For wine going to China, yeah. but being bottled in the Barossa Valley. Um, so <laughs> sometimes if you're really well known, people are going to uh, copy you. Thank you very much. There are a lot of points in that that we want to take up. So just maybe write your questions down because what I find fascinating is we, you know, there's a bit of science. Who, who knew there could be that much science behind a label and, and the kind of data you need to create a label? Um, and I'm gonna, I've got a series of questions, but to, <laughs> the counterpoint to that is the artistic side, your label, what does it look like? So I'd like to ask um, Mel Lesh to come up and um, uh, chat to us about design because that's what she does. She's an artist in her own right, but also a, a graphic designer. So we're just going to get that other point of view for a minute and then we'll take the conversation out there and across here with Pablo and Matt as well. So welcome, Mel. What makes a great label? Something that um, makes you want to go to the, the shelf, pick it up, grab it, draws you in. That's the first step. Um, but I think um, it needs to be simple. Something that's um, emotive, that needs to be well balanced. Um, you can see information across quickly. Um, needs intrigue and a story. Um, as I said, it needs to draw you in and look more than um, it actually costs. And fonts are huge. It's such a um, such an important part of a label. You can have like a really modern, funky font, and it will. Just, just kill the label. It will, it will um, appeal to such a small uh, market that it's not even worth going there. So fonts need to be very classic, clean, and simple. But simple is so hard to do. Um, oh, and the main thing about um, being a good uh, label is um, you need to be true to the product and the producer. I'll give you some examples. Um, Thousand Candles there on the left um, by winemaker um, Bill Downing. Um, I really enjoyed working on this uh, label. Um, I think it's elegant and sexy. It's, um, it tells a story and it's fairly concise. Uh, it's uncluttered and has a sense of mystery to it. Um, I had to take a lot of elements into, um, into making this story simple, combine it, uh, the main story is, um, it's a 19th century account harking back to its indigenous um, occupants, um, a ceremony that, was, that granted free passage to the lands around the property, was witnessed by a European who, referring to the tribesmen holding aloft their fire sticks, remarked, it's as if the twilight of the evening had been interrupted by a thousand candles. And I also um, developed a, another language for them, you can't really see on here, but there's um, a series of um, orange dots which have a high build gloss on it. Um, each vintage has a different name. I think this one's called Witness. And I interpret it into a different language of dots. So each one has a different series of um, dots and colours and um, positions on the label. Um, and I also used um, a cotton stock so it's thick and luxurious, um, has premium cues. 
So it's not only visual, it also appeals to another sense, touch, which increases um, um, the buyer wanting to drink the wine even before opening it. Uh, the next um, example is Shield Estate. Oh, this was a good one to work on. Um, the series here, I worked with um, um, my favourite photographer, Richard Lyons. We went down to um, the, the family property and uh, wandered around and we were shown around the place and um, picked out little um, stories that were um, fun to um, portray for each variety. Right down to the, the rogue chicken there and the... Um, the old Holden bench seat ripped out of the car that everyone used to collapse on um, after vintage, after picking. Um, the old Ford that took the first generation of the Shield family across the continent and broke down into the middle of the paddock and that's where it stayed ever since. And the last one there portrays um, that it's three generations, with the, the grandpa, the father and the son all holding the pitchfork. So, and of course, there was a lot of other elements that kind of needed to be um, put into, but keeping it simple is very important. Now, if you look on the, the label, your eye goes firstly to the, the logo and then to the picture and then to the information down the bottom. So, in general, the eye works in a clockwise direction. So, and um, these labels here have left space where your eye can rest. Um, you'll pick up a messy label and your eye's going all over the place and it can't rest. And I've also used warm colours which are comforting. Um, and the next one, which is um, Spring Seed Wines. Um, the story here was based on um, they, they're, they're organically grown um, vines, they use um, sour sobs as a, a weed mat, so we wanted to work with the flowers and uh, we chose um, old seed packets um, and each, each variety has um, three different seed packets or three different flowers to um, push that story a little bit further. Um, I've also used um, a, a lovely uh, stock, textural, even down to the um, The, the crease in the old seed packet. <laughs> You're smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am do also have KT wines here. Um, I've um, worked with a bit of a, or created a language here with the dots, trying to get across the, the, the mood or the feel of the wines. So the, um, the Melva here, the first on the left, was you know, zesty and um, not, not bubbly, <laughs> but um, bright and happy. So I've used um, fluorescent colours to make it really pop from the, the black. Um, and the, the lighter uh, Riesling and the Rosé, it has a light feel. And the, the second from the right is um, uh, Tempranillo, where it was based on a, a Spanish tile. <clears throat> And I was asked what my favourite label was, but that's like choosing a favourite child. Um, but I have to um, admit that I have a lot of fun working with Steve Pennell. Um, the ones on the, the left there are his cellar door uh, labels, um, which evolved from the ones on the right. Uh, he's still in the middle, has, has the iconic little Steve, as we've nicknamed him. Um, <laughs> The, the first one um, is called Field Street because the cellar door is on Field Street and the next one is Dead End because there's a dead end road around the corner. So they're kind of working in opposite night and day, just a little bit of fun. But um, they all came from his standard range. He has many ranges and they, they all kind of uh, develop, develop from um, his story. It's a, it's a collaboration that we, we're always working together. Um, when he first briefed me in on um, creating a logo, I understood him to be a you know, man of the land. He had his 
feet in the store in the in the sand, sand in the dirt. He goes through every stage, you know, pruning and picking and everything. So I wanted to um, show that he was a man of the land. So iconic. So it's in the middle of the of the label. Has a lot of space. Your eye goes straight there, and then the information is read secondly. But it all works together. That was quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I've used. Um, Oh, but my, my main point I wanted to get across with Steve's labels is that it's not about just the logo or the brand even. The brand is very important because it, the whole feel goes across everything, but it's more about personality. Um, the brand and personality go together and, um, as I mentioned earlier, it needs to be true to the product and the producer. Um, and I pop these in just um, because these are interactive. They just draw on another sense uh, to bring the um, buyer in. Uh, the first one um, by Red Dolls, I uh, come up with a little um, dot to dot. So just a, another fun element which makes people pick it up. Um, the one on the right or the middle, um, I didn't design that, but I put popped them in because it's a bit of fun. You know, you, you pull off the stickers and make your own face and that would make people pick it up. <laughs> and the, the last one there on the, um, on the bottom is um, lint uses lenticular printing, which is you know, when you turn it, it um, has a 3D effect. Did you design that one? No, I didn't design that one either. And that's for the alpha box dice binary. Oh, I just thought I'd um, finish up um, in conclusion by just adding a few, a mixed, they're not all mine. I just thought they were the beautiful labels. Um, but I, I wanted to touch on that you know, Australian wine labels are considered um, right up there in the world. Um, and I think that's because it's you know, our lifestyle, um, our carefree nature, um, and it's allowed us to you know, explore and, and push our boundaries. Um, my last conversation with um, Steve Pennell, we were discussing how um, other countries are envious of our freedom, uh, that they're not that that um, we're not confined by tradition or what's expected. Um, and I think we're producing some really exciting labels, and we we are leading the the world. I quite often go to a um, a website called dialine.com, and it's, it showcases. Um, it showcases um, um, labels from all around the world and they have a, a wine category. And um, most of them are done by Australian designers, so that's great to see. Um, I think that represents who we are as a culture as well. But I do want to um, bring, draw to your attention, let me just check this before I go any further. Just bringing up the two bottles that were at the back yeah. with the different labels and uh, they're just going to be brought up here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. As I expected, which is just as well, the two bottles which um, are down the back there, um, the two different two different labels are actually the same wine. Now, it was very interesting that the... Um, <laughs> the, the KT label, which obviously I, I designed and I um, think it's a nice label, compared to um, one that I um, whipped up, which I tried to make um, cheap looking, um, fonts aren't that great, it wasn't a well thought out um, label. And I just wanted to point out that yes, even winemakers are um, influenced by the packaging. So thank you. What was the score? It was 80 to 54. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you. And again, that wasn't to trick anyone about the wine. It really is that we are so visually um, 
dominated in our society that we go for what it looks like, which I guess jumps to then, you, you know, you talk about the brand and how important it is. Then, you know, we just saw two labels there. And yes, there are people that would know KT's wine and maybe thought, oh, we just like KT, let's give her a tick. And the wine's pretty good, tick. And we looked at that other label, oh. Um, and obviously some other people preferred that wine, probably thought, because um, it had Barossa and, uh, oh, right in front of me, different label. Um, but uh, yeah, Barossa Valley, so there might have been an influence there. So jumping to a Barossa producer then, who has many labels, and we're going to show one a, a bit later, but I just thought for you that, you know, you, you, you have a series of labels <laughs> defying what Larry told us before, that keep it simple and all the same. Matt Gant, you are not the same. So how many wines do you have? How many different labels? And That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think we break every single rule that's in Larry and Mel's uh, handbook. But um, uh, I suppose just to take it back um, to when we started in 2005, both John, my partner in crime in this, and myself were working at St. Hallett, and um, see, for a corporate. And uh, when after, actually it was a boozy trip to Margaret River and 20,000 red vodka Red Bulls in the corner bar of Margaret River Hotel, we uh, resolved to uh, get off our asses and start making the wines that we wanted to make. And I suppose having, you know, um, uh, working for a traditional producer, we wanted to rebel against that and, and fully express ourselves, not just in the wines that we wanted to make, but the way that we presented them as well. So, um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, we've, we're no marketers. Uh, there's, you know, we've made it up uh, on the fly. Um, okay, they're each, we make about 20 different wines. There are 20 different labels. Uh, the, the common denominator is that the, the silver screw cap is, is the same on each with our logo on. Um, the first drop logo appears somewhere on the label. Sometimes it's, it's more obvious than others, uh, but yeah, so there is, there is still some, some connection uh, between them. But I suppose, uh, you know, part of it is uh, wanting to, you know, we, we put a lot of energy into, into and passion, obviously, into the wines that we're, that we're making and the, and the personalities. And we want to also make sure that the, the labels, you know, have, uh, their own unique individual personality. And um, uh, with, uh, I suppose, the, the key factor for us in the design of, 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 of the label is that, well, at the end of the day, would we ourselves pick that up and buy it? And that's number one. Uh, but also that it has a connection to us. It is, as I say, um, that packaging needs to be an extension of our personality. So, um, uh, as the wine is as well. And I think, uh, whilst yeah, we break all the rules, uh, we're still going after 12 years. And I like to think it's because uh, ultimately those, uh, whether it's new customers discovering us, discovering their new varieties and then new labels each time of ours, uh, or whether it's existing you know, customers that are coming back that uh, they uh, get a sense of who we are, our personality, and I suppose that key word that uh, I think is getting quite popular these days, there's authenticity in what we do. So these are not marketed labels, these are our personalities on a label. So yeah, that's really... Okay, it's good you're picking yourself up at the bottle shop, uh, <laughs> but what I'm interested in, and I'm sorry I don't have a slide, it's, it's remiss because I thought, oh, this would help right now, because he's got a series of labels that are quite classic cream coloured for your single uh, sub-regional wines from the Barossa, yep. then these outlandish wines that definitely depict your personality, defying everything that Larry said before, do you have people perhaps started uh, your buyers, bought the Barossa stuff, then came to you, to your Italian varieties or Spanish varieties as a result or vice versa? Um, I would love to, I'd love to be able to answer that, but I can't, to be honest. Uh, I, I say that from a point of view of, um, uh, I think we're starting to learn a bit more. We, you know, we, it was just until very recently, two years ago, it was just the two of us and our bookkeeper. Uh, then. <laughs> You know, two years ago, we, we finally opened a cellar door, our uh, home the brave wine and tapas room, as we call it. And I think um, 
uh, we're starting to, to get a, a um, better understanding uh, mm -hmm. of our customers daily uh, car, uh, that are coming in and that, that connection. But uh, what, what I have found over, over that journey is that, uh, yeah, people have discovered, fell in love with one wine and go, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And then, you know, sometimes they've actually discovered another one of our wines without knowing it. And then suddenly the light bulb's gone on. It's, oh, yeah. this is you. Yeah. And then that's intrigued them to find something else. So mm. anecdotally, that has, you know, has happened. But, um, yeah, uh, I think we're, we're sort of learning more um, about how people, I suppose, interact with our brand, okay. uh, you know, now that we have uh, a home. Yep, okay. Pablo, can I just get you to look at some of those uh, labels there? Can I have a question for Matt first? So yeah, sure. Of course you can. Jump and, in. Because I think I'm gonna, anything I'm going to talk about is really going to contradict Larry as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's I, what we like. Coming from independent retail yep. for 10 years, and I think most of your study was obviously on a larger scale and, and chains. Matt, when you first started, how much wine was sold to independent retailers and restaurants rather than bigger chains and has that changed since your brand has grown and the first drop name has been more known? Uh, yeah, so um, we're still largely on premise and independent. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. It hasn't changed. But it's growing obviously in that time. Cool, yeah, I, 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 and again, you know, independent is, for, for independent retailers and always walked in to East End sellers, we obviously like to spend time and maybe we were the bottle shop you spent 30 minutes in. Um, but even those that don't have time to spend in there, it's, it's more about grabbing their attention, I guess, and more so, and it's not so much brand recognition uh, to start with when you're first getting that customer in, because they're new customers, and it's really important for a, a label like First Drop. Um, when they first came in, people did jump to that label, and that's but the quality of the booze is what really spoke for the wine, and that's the most important thing, you know, the quality of the booze, that's where you get the repeat customers. So for independent retail, it's the same customers coming back because they really like that wine. They've picked it up for the first time, they've grabbed the mother's milk, Shiraz, and because of the label, and that's why they bought it, but they've come back and bought a six pack and repeated customers, and that's what independent retail is not so much a, you know, a large amount of customers over a certain day. We're, we're hidden corner stores. We're not on major roads. We're not caught Coles, Meyer, Woolworths with the right positioning. We're about trying to get repeat customers from the same people and them loving that wine. And the label is really important to grab them in the first case. So just here, <laughs> and just here, yeah. uh, Jean Vieux, you know, I, I want some or something like that. Um, hand down your pants wine, I guess. Glenn Goodall knows all about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, could you, th this is a popular wine, isn't it? Have you sold that or? Uh, we get two bottle allocations, so no. Uh, oh, <laughs> Keep okay. it, we drink it ourselves. But it, it, it does. You uh, love the wine, you love the wine. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I think it's popular because of the label, that wine. I think it's, it's, uh, yep. it's a wine that many winemakers probably won't like because it's pretty natural. So they can get away with that label? I'm not offended by that label, by the way, but I just think, oh, it's a bit puerile, I guess. Uh, whereas Cuvée Sexy, I think that's hilarious in such a tacky way. And I can't believe that that's a wine label. But I had so much fun checking out the website of all the tacky labels. We could be here for days, my friends. You wouldn't believe it. So I've got, I just put a little collage together because I actually found this one, I think, is only done in export and it, um, uh, it's a bit hard. It's like uh, a boarding pass. I actually thought that was a pretty spick wine uh, label. Mel, what, in terms of, of design, what do you think about that wine? No, I like that. Yeah, and why? I think it's a nice label. It's simple. It tells a story. Yep. Um, I would pick it up. Yeah, because it'd be a, an inexpensive one. I think it was only for export, and it, I don't think it exists anymore. But I found that was pretty cool. Unlike this one here, or actually this range, I, I mean, we always laugh about critters on wine bottles, don't we? And I personally would never go for a wine like that, particularly when it's a baboon where you can see everything. Um, <laughs> you can just, yeah, it's... I just, I just don't get that. Is that good design? <laughs> What's that about? Well, people, um, it will appeal to people. People walk past and go, oh my God, pick it up. 
<laughs> this would be a laugh to talk about okay. at the dinner table. So that brand, Larry, would maybe not last very long as a result? What, what do you think? Well, the, I think we're talking two different things. That you certainly would see on a shelf and it would appeal to some people and repel other people. <laughs> um, and I agree with you, if the wine isn't good, I mean, the label gets you to kind of look at it, but yeah. if the stuff in the bottle isn't really gonna make you come back, then the, all the label in the world isn't gonna change that. So it's hard to say. Those kind of things look pretty faddish to me. Yeah. That they'd be out there for a while. I mean, Hardy's did their wick, wicked wines and this and that. And those things don't la typically don't last that long. So, why do they? Why does this fashion continue though? I mean, these labels come and go in their own era. So, given the, you know the the information, the science you have, the good design, um, it's to, just yeah. Sorry, yep. to me that is contrived. That is a classic example of contrived marketed wine. There mm. is no mm. connection to the no producer. Yep. There's no personality behind yep. that, and people see through it. People, you know, we're all consumers, and we're, you know, we're, you look at it straight off the bat and know that is <laughs> that's a that's going to be a fad. Yeah. Um, yeah, whereas actually, once. looking at the the Jean Vieux, I, you know, I can see that there, I feel a, <laughs> feel a connection <laughs> <laughs> to that Do you, man? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, uh, to my mind, uh, yeah, that's the sense I get. Uh, that okay. the, uh, there's more behind that than, than, sure. than on the left. There are labels like that that get cult followings too. There's, of course. Remember the um, old Kellermeister Pink Mink? Oh, yeah. yep. Yep. Amazing label, yep. uh, porn star thing on the front, and uh, we, it, you know, it was cheap, thirteen dollar pink bubbles. It was nothing special, but the following that wine had was just incredible. It's so much so we were sending cases to New York because they couldn't get it. Oh, really? Yeah. But ultimately, that was an original label. Yeah. that is the a retro label that became cool again. Yeah. But it still, you know, had um, authenticity yeah. because it. Uh, you know, the era that that was designed, that was... That was the label, that was, yeah. yeah. what they came yeah. up with, so... I'll point out yeah. another one, because this is a new wine from Darenberg, yeah. and I think the label costs more than the bottle and the actual <laughs> wine. It is actually a beautiful label. Um, they have to hand do it because it's a cutout of three faces. It's... it's I should have bought a bottle, but I'm sorry, I didn't have time to do that. Absolutely exquisite. But would that gorgeous label when you look at that and pick it up, does that make you buy it or does the name Darenberg make you buy it? Anyone? <laughs> I think Darenberg is going to sell yeah. first and foremost. Okay. I mean, they're big I enough for, the for enough people yeah. to know it, but yeah. <laughs> the label, I mean, that's quite interesting because they have that red bit. It used to be a stripe, but yeah. they've taken it off some of their later labels, but there's pieces of it. Yeah. And that one doesn't have anything, mm. so mm. you wouldn't first think of it as Darenberg. Yeah, the cap's yeah. red. They took off yeah. the stripe because of, uh, I think, an issue with Mum, the label, the stripe no, no, of the... No, 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 that was just, that was just one wine. That was just for the, the, dad. the dad. No, I knew it was dad, which was yeah. a sparkling they made to... Because, um, <laughs> of course, you know, it's brilliant marketing, Chester. Let me call my sparkling dad with a double D, because there's a Mum with a double M. <laughs> and they took a few years to get around to him, and so he had a bit of argy-bargy, and then he said, oh, all right, I'll stop making it, and now it's called... Um, Polly? Yeah, Polly, after his, after his mum. I think that's quite smart, I have to say. I'm just going to point out two other labels here. Um, and I guess, look, the average punter is not going to go for those wines because they're exclusive, they're expensive. I'm not going to see them on the shelf. So, no, they're not. But, but, say, you know, but I want to point them out because those labels have basically not changed in something like, oh, that in about uh, 80 years and a little bit longer. So that's good branding, isn't it, Larry? I'm just going to move to the next one, because we need to look well, at I mean, even, even Penfolds, who's adapted their label over time, yep. still looks similar. Yes, it and, does. And you would never start with that label today, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't get rid of it because of the years of recognition. OK. Um, actually, can I get a microphone to Sarah? Because um, I was trying to get this wine here. This is from a, a producer called Dirk Nearport in Portugal. Uh, and not because Sarah was coming out, it's because I love his wines. And I just love this label, but unfortunately the wine's not in Australia. So Sarah, do you mind just giving uh, an intro into that wine and, and the labelling and how it came about? This is another wine called Rodoma, which I also yeah, love. Yeah, so, I mean, it really builds into a lot of 
points that the panel have, have talked about. So the wine on the right, Fabelhaft, um, is Leapport's entry-level uh, table wine. So it's probably half half the price of, 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 of the cheapest of his other wines. So when he introduced it, he's making a lot more of it, makes about four times more than all his other wine altogether. Um, he was, you know, on the horns of the dilemma, do I put it out under the Neport uh, brand or do I give it its own mark? And it, actually, it's not very evident from that uh, bottle that it is under the Neport yeah. overarching uh, brand. Um, and... Um, and he decided to, to, to put it out under the Newport brand in the end because he thought that actually it's still not a cheap wine, number one. Um, but the really interesting thing for me about, about this wine is Fabelhaft uh, means fabulous in German and it actually references a story which is in the storyboard label. And, uh, and that was the first wine that was being sold in Germany. But he sells this wine now in, I think it's at least 18 different markets and each market has a storyboard and a label and, ne and a name which is relevant to the market. Um, so in the UK, it's Drink Me, Alice in Wonderland. So he's trying to make that uh, emotional connection with each market, create an instinct to pick up and touch the bottle. So all the emotional things that you guys were uh, talking about. Um, and, and I think chain of thought just went. There was something else that someone said. I'll just make a note of it. Let me have a look. Well, uh, that wine there is in your first glass, so please enjoy it. Oh, it's yeah. The, the key thing I was going to say is I think a lot of producers, when they're looking at especially entry-level wines, they might tweak the wine for the market, but what he wanted to do was tweak the label for the market. And he said, you know, I'm stubborn. I want people to be tasting the Douro. And, uh, and I want them to be jumping up and, and, and going for my more expensive wines. So he, he had his cake and sort of ate it quite a lot. With, uh, <laughs> but with only he band. could get away with that, yeah, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. But um, now this label here, uh, this is your second um, glass. And the label's not quite sharp there, but if, um, if you know Austrian wine, Gruner um, Weltliner, um, this is from Emmerich Canole, and you know, I think if this label hadn't been a around for a while, who, if that was brand new, who would pick that up off the shelf? <laughs> it well, is. Bruner, Austria. Yeah, no, no, say, no, if you didn't know, that, maybe you, you go straight because Mel, my eye doesn't go to this or this or this, I go there. Yeah. It's just, it's so, it's gothic. Um, it's a great label. Um, who doesn't like that label? Yeah, I can understand why. Yeah. It's gr a bit gross and sort of daggy and so 1970s. But the wine's delicious. So this is the thing where you've got a label there that's not particularly attractive, um, but I think it is. And the wine's fantastic. And of course, they do Riesling as well. So there, it's, you've got a bit of both. You've got sort of Larry's comment, immensely dislike, immensely like. Um, and that, I think, is the label that perfectly sums that up. Larry, do you think so? Well, even if you don't like the label, if you looked at it long enough to know, think that, you might, still might pick up the bottle and decide to buy it because of the name, of what the yeah. variety, the, re the region, the country. So, but you've noticed it. Yes. That's, I think that's the Smart. important part. Yeah. yeah. We're pretty shallow, aren't we, we humans? <laughs> Let's move on to these two talking about penfolds. Um, to me, I think two things. Classic labelling there. The font's beautiful. How can you not love a wine that looks like that? That's the Romani Conti or the, de the domain uh, well, Romani Conti of Australia, I reckon. Um, that label hasn't changed much in its history either. It's, it's just glorious. Now, yeah, are, we, are we obsessed with that wine because of, of the wine or the history of label or, or all of that? That's the, that's the wine, yep. Wendery. Okay. Yeah. And it has Simply. exclusivity as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay it then. It's so, the history behind the wine. Oh, that's yep. Not that they could have any label because it's an awesome label like Romani yep. Conti, I think, or like Monfortino show before. Yep. It's the wine, it's the history behind it. Yep. We, we've done a just a study in the sense of looking at labels in the US market for a project. 
and that label, Winderie, Romani, Conti, fall into the category of um, very high quality wine. People perceive it to be that because it's simplicity. Mm. Now you could put crap wine, you wouldn't know it until you try it, but this, this kind of has that connotation of stands out because it is simple. Yeah. You know. to, if a label, um, just say that started out and it's a beautiful label, how long before we silly humans decide, no, nah, I don't like that wine anymore? Was it the first time or the second time? Say it has an expensive price tag, how long does that take? <laughs> You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of research we've done, a lot of other people have done that say that not only does a label, but the price literally affects your sensory interpretation in your brain. So we know, and there's anecdotal evidence in China, but we know for a fact if you give people wine with a high price, they will like it, even if they don't, and they'll say they like it. And if you actually measure using an fMRI of their brain, their pleasure center will go on if the wine is expensive, even if they don't like it. So you can That's have it. So you can, have, you can, you can it? have it every single time, but long as you're, you yeah. or someone's paid a lot of money, it's, yeah. some people will, will tell the truth. But it's kind of the emperor has no clothes thing, isn't mm, it? Absolutely. We look at penfolds, and penfolds. I guess uh, you know they're so well known everywhere. They're the ambassadors in terms of you know prestige wine with what they've done with um, Grange, and all credit to them. And the irony is now known as this uh, blenders, but also uh, great red wine producers, that I think some of the most exciting wine they're making are their whites, particularly their two Chardonnays, the Otana and this Binet. Now, you know, I don't know if you look at that and go penfolds and go, oh, I'm not going to bloody drink that. Who, does, has anyone done that before to these whites? Yes, you have, being honest, thank you. Yeah, you would. Um, so what do you reckon about that wine three in front of you? You're shaking your head. I think, I really think that's a stunning wine. Um, it is an alternative, obviously. It's, a, it's the Chardonnay. It's the Bin, Binet 15. Um, and it's stonkingly good. So this is where um, you might have an argument. Some of you are shaking your heads where, oh, could, could that bring people around who had a negative attitude towards that? Because I, look, I taste that wine and think it's, you know, I buy it, it's so good. Or oh, is that coming back to your brand comment? Well, I think somebody, like most of the people in this room, somebody like you, have their taste independent of what the label looks like. You know, I think if you... Oh, okay. You know, oh, that's good. I, I'm, I'm not saying you're not influenced. You, your oh, no, sure, no, your sure. expectations would yeah. be high, but I think they're being met. I think that's... Okay. That. Oh, fair call. All right. Uh, Mel, do you think that's their classic labels and both beautiful for different reasons? I'm going to be a bit controversial. I don't really like that label at all. But, um, okay. It's the, the name and the, the yeah. script that it's is selling it. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this it's, never changes really. They had a yeah. slight, slight tweaking, but the colour is really important. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I've had clients come to me and say, I want, um, I want a Penfolds label. This is the red you're to use. This is the script you're to use. This is. Benfold. No can do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's right. So the last two reds, obviously there's the Wendery. Please enjoy that because we, oh, I had to kill someone to get that <laughs> wine. Um, <laughs> by a Kim and Bart, thank you very much. And then the last thank one you. is that lovely um, wine from Panel. And I have to say, when Steve went out on his own, I think it's in 08 or something a bit earlier, and I saw his labels, I, I bought those wines on the labels. They were so beautiful. And so I found out who you were because of his labels. So there okay. you go. Um, gorgeous wines, except for the corked ones, sorry. But what we're going to do now, either drink or tip, because we're going to get the next round through and continue the discussion um, for, for uh, well, let's just continue the discussion. How about we open it up to the floor for a minute, because I'm being a bit sneaky from, with the next round. And Chuck down the back has a question for us. Oh, and he did say to me, Jane, could you, you know, tell them what my funny uh, joke was that the yes. tits for Tanat is Tanat is totally sensational. So you're off the hook. Uh, I kind of want to put this to Matt. Uh, I've, I've known your uh, brands for a couple of years, 
And I love the Mother's Milk brands and the cartoon situation. And I also love your, your, your Sepals Philip and Grenock interpretations at the first drop. Uh, do you think that you could, if you switched the labels and you had the cartoony label going to the cream and the classic label to your Mother's Milk, would they, what, could you command the same price for the cream with the cartoony label? And do you think you would get more money for the mother's milk with that more classic label? Because I do think that the label implies price to a lot of people. Um, all I can say is that mother's milk is our most popular wine, and that is, you know, our heart and soul. You know, the style of the wine is, um, you know, uh, okay, for those people who don't know, this is a, a Barossa Shiraz that we started making back in the, you know, 2004 was the first vintage that was at the height of the sort of supercharged balls and all Barossa Shiraz, and we wanted to get back to making a soft, textured, slurpy expression that you could drink, you know, hopefully a whole bottle of, rather than just appreciate a glass, hence the name Mother's Milk. Um, and, you know, that style and that uh, name and that label, you know, has just gone from strength to strength. And, um, yeah, I, I think everything in it works well together. So. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I, I couldn't ever contemplate sort of a switch like that, I suppose. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the wine Just making design. sure that everybody's kind of tipping out their glasses to yeah. make the life a bit easier for the stewards. I know it's hard to tip Wendery in the... Uh... I just drank it. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think Matt made a good point in the fact that that label is designed for the kind of wine that he's made. Yes. So there's yep. a synergy there that if you switch them, you lose that synergy, so. Well, what does, what does that mean? The, the wine is, the label is the wine that's made, but isn't that surely what happens because you've got the label, it goes to it, and then it becomes it. You, you, you know what I mean? I'd, I'd like to hear well, the designer talk about that. Uh, well, Mel? You can say your word. Or, or Matt first and then jump well, to Mel. No, I mean, just to reiterate, the, we're, the notion, the, the wine came before the name and the label. So, you know, it was then, okay, this is, this is the style that we're making. And, yeah, the name, actually, it all came together at the same time. So the, the name, you know, fitted the style. And then I love comics, so, yeah, it's a comic. <laughs> It's a comic uh, label, tells the story of the first vintage of John and I making this wine, and yeah, it all just um, serendipitously sort of came together, so um, yeah. We're just talking about which, which comes first, the wine or the label, and how do you... What question... Oh, obviously what the wine comes first, and then the, the winemaker will brief me, and um, well, I get to know the winemaker, I know his personality, or their personality, and um, it evolves. The, Definitely. The question was, do you taste the wine? <laughs> I think she does. Are <laughs> you kidding me? Jump, and just yeah. from your comment before, I was very interested, you know, it's about the story. Mm. Please do not take this uh, in any way other than, if you didn't know that Thousand Candles wine, you'd look at the label. I think it's a very attractive label, but I don't know the story. William Downey also makes Pinot, and he has, uh, he's got Reg Mombasa labels, um, who's an Australian artist, and they're really gorgeous, mm. but that's all he has. So he's mm. got no description, Larry, at the bottom no, that says, yeah, yeah. says what it is. Um, this, this is just for people perhaps who haven't um, seen the label, really gorgeous labels, but Thousand Candles. I mean, what's that about? And it was expensive, and people poo-pooed it. Well, it's not the label. <laughs> the price. It, it's an ex exclusive um, item. Um, you're, you're, you're drawn into it. You want to know more. You want to be part of the club. You, you go and you, you find the website. You, you find out the story. You, you're drawn in. I, I, mean, I think Theo makes a really good point because some of these limited, limited edition wines, you don't need to attract everyone. You have yeah. to pique some interest and then you have to back it up with what's in the bottle. That's, yeah. that's all you have to do. It, using Mel, it was great to see that she was on the forum because we worked on a project together. Uh, there's a Riesling called Cantor Riesling in Adelaide Hills. Oh, oh yeah. The, um, right. the very first vintage, I don't know if anyone saw that label, it was probably the worst label ever made. <laughs> uh, it was green and white. Uh, it was designed 
well, no one takes credit for it, but <laughs> it was... Or discredit for it. Yeah, it was uh, the owner of Eastend Cellars and a former, former manager, I can confirm. <laughs> um, and it, it didn't sell, you know, you had, you had Egon Muller, one of the yeah. greatest Riesling winemakers in the world behind this label. Uh, it, was a, it was a great wine. It's, you know, it's a Riesling from Australia. It's as popular, it was well-priced. It did not move. The label changed. We engaged Mel. She put something together absolutely fantastic. Much more traditional. It's, yeah. it's white with black writing. Very classic with lovely embossing. And, and it, it looks beautiful. The wine is now recognised and the sales have gone up and, and it's, it's grown from there. Yeah. People know that label now. Larry, it's what, what um, Pablo just said then def it contradicts your comment then, doesn't it, about... Um, you know, stick with the label. Sorry, Larry. Well, I mean, you know, the, you don't no, they, they said nick off to that label. Well, well, you stick with a label that works. I mean, yeah. okay. the last thing, I'm just, I the last thing, I mean, we all, no. in our little bits of consulting, run across someone who's, you know, yeah. aunt or daughter or cousin is studying art and they make a label and it's really bad yeah. and it's got to be changed. I mean, you know, so but those, those critter labels will change to something different in, in three years okay. time. It'll be, this, it'll, be a com, but it'll be complete new branding. Uh, it's, 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 it's always important for the brand, to, it, whether it's traditional, whether it's comical, to be. I just wanted to make a comment that um, while you're dissing the cousin who's, or the niece who's doing well, the label, a lot of us are small boutique producers and marketing and making labels, printing labels, doing unique labels with text, you know, with, with beautiful um, cotton fabrics. It's really expensive and we're small batch producers. So... Um, well, can I, can I ask you... Be kind, be do, kind. Do, well, we're trying our best. Do you... Do you um, skimp on your oak barrels? Do you skimp on preparing the vineyard before you plant your grapes or the hand labor in? Well, right, and so the, and the same applies for the labels, okay? I mean, you know, you have to do the best you can and I just think the investment in good marketing will pay its way back if you can scrape the money first up for someone who knows how to design a good label. And, and obviously now the evidence is overwhelming if, if um, you know, today confirms that. So it's like the winemaker says goodbye to the wine once that screw cap's on or cork or whatever they're using and your label is actually also your, it's how you engage with that consumer that doesn't know you. And as you say, it's your personality or, um, and I look at a lot of labels lots and lots, and there's some truly woeful ones, but I understand small producers, but you don't have to do anything super fancy or expensive. Um, it can be really stylish and not so, but it's, you, you have to make the effort to um, perhaps engage someone to discuss that. So let's jump to perhaps Ashley here. No. We've got some other questions so can coming just, up. Can I just jump in Yes, there? please do, sorry. Oh, Ashley, hold yeah, on, yeah. hold on. Sorry, Mel. Ashley. Um, you jump, you, you um, um, give the brief to the designer, you tell them your budget, and the designer can work within those um, yeah. perimeters. Good. Yeah. We've spoken a lot and about... And still have something beautiful. <laughs> you can go, Ashley. <laughs> We've spoken about uh, labels on bottles. Yes. And I've spent the last 18 months running a two litre cask line. It always wonders me what, why, as a uh, industry, we're not revamping getting the cast market really sexy because also 12 months ago it was really hard to get glass yep. and it caused a lot of um, yep. you know winemakers a lot of heartache I mean can we actually make cast wine really sexy and make it actually mainstream because really as a uh, as a vessel it's actually quite good yeah and you you did a very good uh one, uh, the Smith and... Winesmiths. Yeah, Winesmiths, which I thought was really cool. It, um, it's a, it's a recycled paper uh, with an owl on it, and I thought, you, and smaller, so it didn't look like, and let, you know, that awful phrase, goon bag, I hate that, I hate that name, because I actually think it's a really smart invention, um, but now it has these connotations of, um, you know, uh, it's what you buy. So oh, you need the you need the microphone back. We it would be really good, and I this is just a, a rough idea, but uh, I think it'd be great someone like Matt to 
yep. some wine into a two litre cask and actually almost sort of like stick it up the, uh, um, mm. what people think and say, well, you know, I'm actually, I believe in this. Matt, why would you and why would you not do that? Uh, oh, uh, don't worry, it's crossed my mind. Um, <laughs> so all I can say is, um, yeah, just give us time. Um, <laughs> but one, one thing on that is, um, you know, that, that Sweden um, is, a, is a huge um, consumer of box wine and a lot of the... Um, Could uh, the councillor be quiet, please? <laughs> it's all right. A lot, a lot of those uh, cast wines, you know, some really smart, smart packaging uh, and a lot of um, uh, particularly, yeah, you know, European you know, producers, uh, you know, have, uh, have actually you know, created some uh, some great um, uh, billboards because that's really what they that's are. What I mean, is. you've got this huge area, you know, not just two litre, but if you're four litre, uh, you know, cast to to you know tell a story and um, and put your name yeah. out there. So, um, uh, yeah. We'll, I'll take up that uh, that gauntlet for sure, but maybe you can have a have a chat to your lumber about. Cut me just uh, into there's there's people that have tried as well. There was I remember five years ago there was a package that was more of a one liter, so more accessible, and we tried to push that, but we it just didn't sell. The consumers just needed no more, and you know it's not just you know the lighter. It's, there was so many great benefits about it, but just consumers weren't ready for it then. It Hopefully they will be soon because I reckon it'd be awesome. It could possibly be about that the minimum packaging volume for a bag in box or whatever is about 20,000 litres, so you can't do a little trial and see how it goes. I think one of the uh, other issues is what we call in marketing prototypicality. I mean, people don't expect a great wine in a box. And we same thing happened with screw caps, you know, but once a whole group of producers got together to make a statement, I think it could be done. Yeah. Second reason is age, aging. So it's got to be done for wines that can, you know, need to be drunk quickly. But if you get over those two things, I think it will. I, I think there's a possibility mm. there. Yeah. yeah, definitely it needs uh, have, uh, a, collect, a collective <laughs> approach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, just to go back to Sweden, you've got, you know, Premier Cru Chablis in bag and box over there. So it, uh, it can be done. Yeah. Mm. Um, so this I reckon is bring back the flagon as well. Yeah, yeah. This is coming more from a yes. artist Christian out here. Yep, Daria. Perspective. I don't really know a lot about wine. I come down to work here, um, but predominantly I work in the arts um, in Adelaide, and I've actually got a lot of friends that do wine labels. I've got a friend that's just uh, finished a series for Alpha Box and Dice that looks incredible, um, screen prints, and I've got a friend from Adelaide who's over now in the USA. Um, ankles that did the Delacuente um, labels, and that is really impeccable. And I think this is not a question, but more so from an artist's perspective, of artists love to drink. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> pulling your local artists in to do your labels um, pulls those two communities together, and also building a story um, behind the labels, as Meg, Meg, sorry, yeah, was saying before, um, is really important. And from an art background labels are obviously big for us, but I think Delacuente was really clever with um, creating characters for each of their bottles, and then not only that, but going that step further to create a comic book that brought that whole series to life. Yeah. So it was, the art was just as important as the wine, and that's so respectable as well, seeing that from an artist's point of view, and it really draws in a lot of artists as well. So yeah, involve your local artists, because that's really important. Well, that's a, a nice Darren. sentiment. We've got a couple of uh, people behind you, Rollo, Kate McIntyre, but um, two other questions. I had another one too. Yeah, I've got a question for, for Larry. Penfold's recently brought out a product uh, where there's a non-transparent skin that completely covers the bottle so you can't see anything. What, what's the strategy there when you can't even see <laughs> the product? Well, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> so I can't. But that must, you want to say something? Because it might, maybe it's just, because it is unique that it sets it aside and makes people question and want to pick it up and look at it. Uh, the only reason I could think of would be, you know, for us wine docks are like playing options and <laughs> don't want to, you know. Spend money on a bag. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a paper bag, so that's much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, Guys, I, I think it's really fascinating talking about labels um, and and the feedback that a lot of winemakers and wine brands get about their labels. It can get it can get 
very personal and people can get um, very worked up about being told that they're doing a bad job, that their label's no good, that they have to go and spend a lot of money on redesigning the packaging. And I think I just, I just wanted to make a point that a lot of the labels that we've looked at today, so they're, they're part of the personality of the wine and the person or people behind the wine as well. And so, yes, the label's really important. Um, and I think Larry's uh, comment that once you've got uh, something that's recognisable for your brand, if you want to redesign your labels or tweak them, don't change that recognisability. But I just wanted to share a little story that a few years back we were having a bit of trouble with our distributors um, with our wine and Muraduck Estate. We're a little business, but we're quite well known. And the first quite well known amongst our customers and our label's been the same with a few tweaks for about 30 years. And our new marketing manager with our distributors said, I hate the labels, get rid of the labels, let's just redesign the whole packaging and look fantastic. I'm really glad that I said no, and by the way, you're sacked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because that's, if you do have, even if the label's not perfect, even if some people don't like the label, even if you've tweaked it a bit and annoyed people by tweaking it, mm. but kept the sense of your, the pride that you have in your business and your label and how it expresses you, I think it's a really important thing to, I think it's awesome to have experts consulting and giving you some help with, you know, making it a little bit prettier, and making it a little bit nicer, but it is just one part. It's a very important part of the whole package. And don't, I just would hate for everyone to go, oh my God, quick, let's throw out our labels and start again uh, as a result of this, uh, of this no, discussion. Yes. <laughs> Look, this, this is personal because if we don't have a talk and taste that raises issues and discuss them honestly and touch a raw ne nerve here and there, what's the point of having these sessions every year? Because it's about opening this up, being in a very inclusive environment to discuss this. So no one up here is actually saying, go and change your labels. David Matzer, don't you worry about that, you make gorgeous wines. But sometimes you get so close to them that you can't see what's there anymore and you do need an outside view. I'm not saying, and I, you know, I, I find it frightening that you get these uh, marketing, you know, people come in. Some of them are great, by the way. Of course they are. Um, but you're a small business and you can say, mm, no, nah, we're not going to go with you because you have more of an understanding of your business than they do. And if you thought their concept, perhaps they prepared something for you earlier and you thought, Oh, that's terrible. But that's not what we're suggesting. Um, and of course, um, it, it's all personal because, as Larry says, you see something on the shelf. You see that canole label that's really gothic and out there. And some people love it, some people don't. So, it, just, it so must express something they want to express. Yes, indeed. I'm Comment? Just, I'm, I'm, there's questions are banking up up here, but just bearing in mind there's only 10 to 15 minutes left, we might, I might hand over to Jane to just. Um, have a little look at what's in your glass and oh, then we'll continue bit. the questions yeah, no, after that. Is that okay? We might go five minutes over time. Stewards, can we go five minutes over time? Thanks, Zach. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, what I'm going to do here is you've got five labels, just the labels. Um, here, I'm going to point to wine one and I want you to tell me what... So wine one is obviously this no, white wine. Right. Does it come from this wine? Put your hand up if you think it does. Wine one, yep, okay, we've got one, two, three, four, whoa, this is great. Um, say about 10 for one. Uh, what about the second label? Second label for this wine one? One. Two. Two, thank you. What about the third? Could be. Wow, good on you. That's, I think, most of you there. And what about the, that one there? Who thinks it's that one? Okay. And who says it's that one? Okay, for the people who says it's that one, is that because you know the wine? Yeah. All of you? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. yeah, so you excluded. So let's go, <laughs> let's go back to this wine here. 
Okay, it's not that wine, definitely. It is definitely not that wine which had some good support. It is this wine. Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> labels, are they important? Um, do they reflect the wine in the glass? Ah, what would I know, I just drink the stuff. Okay, so that wine there, now I know it's a process of elimination, uh, however, so the second wine. Okay, is it that wine there? No. Why? Okay. Oh, red, red wine. Okay. <laughs> Who says it's that wine? Same, same people. <laughs> same people do. Okay. Except Jenny Chalmers, you were a new one. Thank you very much. Um, sort of about ten. And who says it's that wine? Maybe that one. Yep. Cool. That's most of you. And who says it's that wine? Did you call this an orange wine? Yeah. Oh, a lot of you. You um, will work out yeah, something in a minute. Think, yeah, okay. Now, what's amazing? It's that wine. Now, obviously, it has the name of what it is, but, the, oh, sorry. Um, so what that is, uh, I'll, I'll re reveal them in a minute. So just by, ah, uh, oh, this is good now. Ooh so we've got three reds. Now, clearly, there are only three labels left. So I'm going to go to, wine, I'm going to go to this wine here, three. Who says it's that wine? It says it's that wine. I'm going with James. And he knows it says it's that wine. I'm going with you. <laughs> oh, this is so brilliant. This is research, Larry. Yeah, it is. Seriously. Okay. Most of you. I've, I've done the research and no one gets it. <laughs> it's, it's, okay. It's, it's, At least we're consistent. It's chance. It's chance. We're, we're consistent. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, it's this label. Woo! So, <laughs> and so for the last two wines, I'm just going to say um, this wine here. So your second last wine is it this one? Put up your hand. Yep. Okay. Who says it's that one? Yeah, that's because you all know now. Because um, what's interesting? Yep, you basically all got it wrong, and we would have done too. That that's the point. Um, what we have here, and you'll get a sheet at the end with all the wines that we've had um, this afternoon in this session. In fact, I think they might be coming out shortly. So wine one is this wine. It's a Riesling. And it's one of these labels you look at, and I'm going to get Pablo to talk about this because you, you know them well. It's a Riesling. It's a delicious wine. And it's one of those labels you look at, you love it. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I hate it but I would notice it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Pablo. Yeah, you notice it and this is gonna, because I've been probably bagging you, Larry, on everything I've said, <laughs> this is gonna <laughs> report, um, confirm. Uh, they, they had an issue in the UK, so not long. So, say who they are. Uh, sorry, some yeah. Young Punks winery uh, based in Clare Valley. So uh, they, ha they got a big following. It also helped when uh, Jamie Oliver Instagrammed that certain wine and you know, it all went off and, and that wine really built a great following. Uh, and probably two years ago, uh, government in UK told them that that looks too much like a comic book, it's too, appear uh, too appealing to 15 year olds yeah, 15 year old. and <laughs> they, ha they couldn't do anything even though it's 15 pounds a bottle too. Because yeah. teenagers are buying yeah. that, yeah, aren't they're they? Buying, they're buying off oh, by Claire really Valley Riesling good. for 15 pounds. Yeah. So they, they had to put a black marker over it. They didn't change the label. They didn't change anything. They just put this black sort of yep. cover over it. And you could still make out the label. Uh, but you had to pick it up and look at it closely. Yes. And sales dropped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I should have had that picture there because I actually think that's a smart way around that. Uh, yeah. Quite an artistic way yeah. around it. Um, just you? jumping around, the second wine is the um, Milton Limiamo, which is very different to their wine. So this is one of the comments that Larry made that um, these labels that was very different. This is, but I, you know why I think this is valid? I think the label, oh, thank you very much, whoever did that, probably Kim Chalmers helping me out. I can pop that down now. Um, I love that label. And it's very different to what they do. They're a beautiful biodynamic producer in New Zealand. 
And that wine, which is basically Gewürztraminer, which there are a couple of other things in there, but it spends an inordinate amount of time on skins, which you could probably gather from that sort of phenolic grip, but I think it's a beautiful wine. Um, they're one of the, the um, champions of biodynamics in uh, New Zealand, and I love it. It's a gorgeous wine. It says field blend, but it's uh, dominated by Gewürz. Moving along to the third wine, where you couldn't get really more um, artisanal than Anton von Klopper, who's in, based in South Australia. A lot of you might know him. The labels are hand done, uh, related to his children. He puts them on himself. He dips the wax in. Everything's just labor intensive, but he is small. And I actually, I love that label. There is a case where, he, he, you know, yeah. it's, he did it basically. Anton's daughter actually draws every one of his labels. There you so go. She, she does yeah. a picture and he puts it on a label. And it works, doesn't it? Does it? Um, yep. The first question is, none of you set the guy in and spoken about, you're talking about Yeah. yeah. He put meadows for the wine industry in social media. So this is a question about how important is it to reward wines, um, not through their labels, but more so through social media. But that could be labels as well. Sometimes I tweet a lot of wine. If I've had a cracking wine for lunch or dinner or I've just reviewed something, I think, gee, that's a beautiful wine. And I'm sure I did it for actually a lot of these wines here, not the Anton von Klopper, because very kindly he bottled that for us just to have it. So um, by hand, of course, only a couple, a week or two ago. So that was very good of him to do that. Um, so Matt, Matt, maybe I'll jump to you because there's your label. I want you to tell the story of it. Has social media been important for you in terms of that label or any others? Um, uh, yeah, I suppose um, particularly Instagram, I'd say, uh, is, is the big one uh, more than anything. Yep. You know, a shot uh, of, of a bottle you know, anywhere in the world that then suddenly you know, um, yeah, opens up, may, may you know, uh, pique someone's curiosity in another part of the world. So, um, yeah, there definitely labels, um, you know, do play play a part in that. But um, uh, to be honest, I, I am a social media luddite myself, so I'm not on Facebook or uh, Instagram personally. So that is I'm the wrong person to ask. I know, but that's why you're not responding to me now. I get it. <laughs> I thought you were just not a friend because I wasn't a friend. Now, it's so complicated, isn't it? But um, thank you for clarifying yeah. that. There you go. Oh. About social media. Yeah. Well, what we've studied in social media is it's great, but it doesn't bring in many new buyers who don't know about you. It's great for reminding and talking to. If you're a retailer, of course, you can tweet or now Instagram about new wines, but you're sending to the same people, and that's great. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't help you getting buyers who don't know about you. So, to some degree, you relying on, I mean, we were talking the other day, Beck, I think, had to leave, but about Facebook, because you can use Facebook, and you can get friends of friends of friends, but as a commercial entity, you have to pay extra to do that. They don't let you yeah, do it just automatically. Yeah. So. Oh, those pesky little people. But that's what our research, research shows, is that social media is great at reminding and contacting people who know you, but it's not going to expand your p no, potential that's base. that's right. It's a waste of time, mostly. Um, it, 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 well, it's not a waste of time. It's just, it's mm. not going to grow your brand more. That's what we're saying. They, therefore, that would be a waste of time, wouldn't it? Or is it just recognition? Well, you want to, you want to remind your, you know. Oh, OK. Yeah. All right. James, yeah. just like wine is subjective. Oh, hold on. Sorry, James. You need the microphone. What? I'll repeat your question. No, say it. You're, you're what, not a Luddite. Yep. No, you're not a Luddite. As far as social media, yes. what you're saying, just like wine, is subjective. It might be a waste of your time, but it's certainly not a waste of time of your potential customers. Good. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, I don't have anything to sell. <laughs> well, I, 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 would, I would say that people have 
even your wine drinkers have broader interests than wine. So when you do yeah. mm -hmm. talk about the dog in the vineyard, you know, which is a, you know, we've talked about that a lot, but whatever is happening, those are all interesting things that can expand your reach beyond just the wine, narrow wine interest. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the thing is, it's immediate. That's what I do love. Uh, I use social media, by the way. Um, I love the immediacy of it, that I can be sending a, um, a tweet or a Facebook page, and Sarah, who, we're friends anyway, I can email her, but you know, I know she's around or where she is because of your, you know, seriously, I love that. She's following <laughs> Yeah, I'm following her. Thank you for following me, but I'm following you. I'm, I'm not stalking you. There's a difference. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't say no, I didn't. I know you didn't. But anyway, um, I'm just going to talk about the um, the last. Uh, we're going to go back to this wine, but just jumping to the end. I've got an awful bottle here. I don't know if everyone else's is pretty. Yeah. Oh my god, which is a bit disappointing. Um, true, truly, uh, yes, unattractive. And what's interesting about that label, though? because um, they went through a lot of trouble with that design. It's Save Our Souls, and the label actually has velvet on it. So the purple cross is textural. You feel it. So I'm interested about that. Let's just jump to about, sorry? No, we're just talking about what's wrong with it, that's all. Yeah, no, we know what's wrong with it. Let's move on. It's okay, about, but it's, I, I actually. I, sorry, it's yep. Kim. I'm over here with the rolling Oh, there you are. But that uh, high VA style is typical of that wine. And that was that was one of the things that I found interesting and why I put this wine forward because the label is luscious and beautiful and sensual and you want to pick it up and you want to drink it and the wine is quite bracing because of that VA and so it's quite a contradiction but the la like you want to buy that bottle of wine when you pick it up in the shop. Mm. Who's going to buy it? <laughs> oh, oh, Ned and James, that is beautiful. Thank you. And William Downey will be very happy that you do so. Okay. Um, let's just go back to the minkia. Who speaks Sicilian dialect here? <laughs> Who? Oh, no, you don't. Um, minkia. Allora, di, dimmi, Mataganda. Uh, tell me. Okay, so um, I suppose that when we're coming up with the label, there's 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 maybe two two different approaches. Well, a few different approaches. Uh, it might be that we have a specific idea, concept in our heads and we work with the designer to, uh, and sometimes that becomes a journey as well. We might have an idea in our head and in fact we end up sort of somewhere else. Uh, but other times we have the actual stage name, you know, uh, yep. in, a, in our mind. And I suppose uh, Minkia um, uh, yeah, came about from uh, first tasting this wine, uh, first vintage uh, post mail out, out of barrel, and um, so I've spent some time working in Italy. Uh, John is Greek heritage, but married into an Italian family. And we looked at each other and just went, thank you. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the name sort of uh, stuck, and I wrote it on the barrel. And, uh, and then when we were thinking, what are we, what are we gonna call this wine? We thought, well, I think we've got to go with it. So, okay, what does minchia mean? So, uh, it is a playful term in, uh, I would say, in Italian. It is like an exclamation mark, like, wow. Uh, but uh, I should say, for full disclosure, it's Sicilian slang for the male appendage. So, uh, so be careful where you use it. Yeah. The word. <laughs> I think both. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think mean, so. Sort of in terms of then uh, brief with with the designer we worked on on this uh, project was, uh, you know, um, uh, I suppose um, you know picking up on those uh, that uh, the meaning of that word and uh, hence the zipper that's yeah. on there and actually that oh, zipper that what it means? and that zipper that See? zipper is actually <laughs> is raised if we had the bottle here you, or or you, what well, we do you could actually feel feel the zipper that's on it that is also like a wine glass and then the inspiration for the patterning is kind of like you know Versace and yeah. uh, all those sort of great sort of out uh, sort of uh, more avant-garde Italian designers uh, behind it do you um, Okay, um, you know, taking Ned's comment earlier about the music, um, you know, you, the indie scene, and then it becomes, you know, everyone's scene. 
maybe have labels become the you know record like as in wine labels? Do you reckon some of them are replaced record labels in terms of what people are trying to do? I mean, there's an artistic element. We've heard about that. Yeah. So let's get a CD that goes with the label. Yeah. Oh, no, well, for sure. well, actually, one of our labels is called uh, our Pinot Grigio is called Endless Summer, and the, it's actually a <laughs> CD, and the back label is my soundtrack from the 90s growing up in the UK. So uh, I have thought of actually reproducing the have. soundtrack, but you can't afford the royalties. <laughs> exactly. It was Boring. just a thought. So, yeah. Um, yeah, podcasts yeah, well, would be oh, a great yeah. idea. Yes, there you go. Um, well, yeah. we have time for one question. Um, because if not, um, because yes, is there oh, Rollo? Rollo got cut off. Oh, Rollo got cut off. Sorry, Rollo. Because it's getting warm and we need gin and tonics and beers, don't we? I, I was just going to, and this does tie in with that discussion uh, and, and the sort of dichotomy between more uh, mainstream labels for retail. Um, in, in my experience, uh, I find that if there's a bit of subtlety in the label, a story but not the full story, and I think it's, the safe, it's safe to say for all the labels up there, if you don't tell the whole picture and you're selling into uh, on-premise and boutique retail, the buyers become your spokesperson. So I, I find that if you can yeah. give them yeah. some, some ownership of the brand and some investment in, in, the, in the balance of the story, then they want to go forward and tell it. And, but if it's all up there and on the label and doesn't require anything more, then the job's done for them and they have no investment in the label. So I, I quite like the idea of that sort of a little bit of subtlety if that's your target mar market, especially with alternative varieties where I think there is more story that needs to be told, uh, then that sort of restrained label can work quite effectively. That invites them to be part of the club. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up. It's getting a wee bit warm in here. Um, I'm just going to say thank you to some people that um, can't make this event happen without them, and that's certainly the stewards who have also looked after the judges all week. Thank you. You are brilliant, and we love you. And I know I pushed you hard, but please still love me. They will be back tomorrow at the long lunch, but we can't do it without them. Um, I think we've had a great session today because it's about generating conversation, discussion, and we can take that further at the various pubs called Stepanos around the corner. Um, but just to kick, go, go back to Sarah's keynote speech, thank you very much. And with Ned and Chuck, I think the key points there, it's about diversity, location, and let's not dilute that message no matter what we're going to call this collective bunch of great, great varieties and the fantastic producers that make them. Um, I'm not here because I think it's fun to spend a week, you know, tasting 770 wines and then uh, rock up at uh, Talk and Taste. I do it because I love what you do and I believe in the great varieties you, the great varieties you grow for Australia for the future. So I thank you um, to, to them. To Emily and Leanne, thanks for that little um, treat with the glasses and being very generous for the three. Now I'm going to get, go and get a collection going. Terrific. And to... Mel, yeah. oh, you know, it's very generous, very generous. To Mel, Pablo, Matt and Larry, thank you for um, really making this such an interesting exercise. I, um, as I said, once, once the theme was put together, I spent way too much time checking out labels. And I hope today you take away some of the salient points and you may not go and change your label at all, but have a, you know, real think about what the research shows what the artist or the graphic designer is saying because they're linked and I think art and science, that kind of data does come together, together and there's valuable information in that. Uh, I find it fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.